Hey folks, so I wanted to make a video on my favorite resources and tools that I'm using while I'm coding. So these are not the really obvious tools like, you know, VS Code or GitHub that everyone knows about already. These are the tools that really help me save time while I'm building websites, which is why I'm using them all the time. And I'm hoping that you'll find these helpful as well. All right, let's get into it. All right, the first resource is MDN or Mozilla Developer Network. So anytime that I'm trying to look up the correct syntax for like an HTML tag or a CSS property, I will use MDN. And if you didn't know, Mozilla is the organization behind the Firefox browser, which I also love and use. And they have this website, the Mozilla Developer Network, which is just a super useful and very informative reference for anything related to the web. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript, accessibility, and a lot of other topics. So it is a really huge website. So when I'm using it, usually what I'll do is I'm going to run a search. Um, I use DuckDuckGo and I'll search for MDN and then whatever I'm you know trying to find out about. So for example, let's say we want to read up on the CSS Z index property just because we need a little refresher. So then MDN Z index is going to be what I search for. And if you put MDN in your search term, usually the first result is going to be developer.mozilla.org, which is the MDN website. All right, so when we click on that result, um, we go to the Z index page on MDN. And what we have here is up at the top, um, we have a little label that tells you the browser support for this property. So this says baseline widely available and it's green and you see these green check marks next to the different browsers. So that tells you that this is, you know, really widely supported and you can expand the little down arrow there to read a little more info about it. So I'm going to come back to the browser support thing a little bit later on, but let's just check out this page and see what we have. So under the browser support, you have a kind of brief description of what the Z index property does. And then you have a try it, a little live demo. And this is pretty helpful because it's a really quick way to see what happens with different values of Z index. And they have this, you know, mini kind of demo website on the right side. So I find that pretty helpful too. So after that, we have the syntax. So this is going to tell you the different possible types of values that Z index can take. And then under that we have kind of a longer description of the different values and you know what it means and other things that um, might entail when you set Z index to a certain value. And this can get a little bit dense, so you can just kind of skim through the page and find what you're looking for. So after the syntax, um, they have more kind of real world examples. So here for the Z index, you have some HTML code and then you have some CSS styles under this. And, you know, this is using different Z index values for different parts of the website. So this is helpful because it kind of shows you how Z index can be applied on a real website. And then if you keep going, the next section um, is going to be the specifications. Um, now, I just want to let you know this link is going to lead you to the actual CSS working group with the specs of the Z index property. And just as a warning, um, I'm going to show you what this is, but it is very dense. Um, so I wouldn't recommend trying to learn from this unless you really want to read it and MDN just doesn't have enough information for you because these specs are basically instructions for how browsers should treat all these different CSS properties. And it really gets into the nitty gritty. It's incredibly dense. I would say it's not really meant for the average user. Um, so I would kind of skip over the specs link again, unless you really want to read about, um, Z index. So down at the bottom, they have uh, more info about the browser compatibility with the different browsers and the different um, versions of each browser. You can click on them to tell you some release dates if you need to know about that. And they'll also give you browser support for different values of the property because sometimes they don't all happen at the same time. So I'm going to talk about browser compatibility a little bit with um, the next resource called Can I Use? But until we get there, um, I just wanted to mention one more thing. Um, in the left sidebar, they have basically links to all these other CSS properties. And this is kind of like a reference for the other content on MDN that you can look at. So for example, they even have like tutorials over here. 
Um, and these are kind of simple sort of text-based tutorials, but they are pretty good explanations. Um, and then, you know, they have a section about JavaScript and different things like that. So there's just like a ton of info on this website. Um, again, it is really huge. So I usually use this by doing a search for MDN and then whatever property or element I'm trying to find out more about. All right, so I had mentioned, can I use for browser support info? So let's go over there next. All right, so here we are at caniuse.com. So this website has really detailed browser support for CSS, HTML, JavaScript, and basically anything related to the web. So the way that I use this is in this top, this giant search bar here, I'm going to type in a CSS property. Let's do a different one. Let's try the gap property. So when you type it in, you see some results. And this is a table that's kind of similar to what we had seen on MDN, but there's a little bit more information here. So you have the different browsers, each in their own column, and then each browser has different rows for the different versions. So the older versions are up top and you can kind of tell because they're red, meaning the older versions don't support um, the property that we're looking at. And then under that you have um, the rows that are green, which means that they do support it. You can hover over them to find more detailed um, release information and things like that. So this is really helpful for specific browsers. Another thing I find really helpful when I'm kind of researching a property to see, you know, if I want to use it is to, in the top right corner, they have this global uh, support. And this is 94.6% for the GAT property, which is really good. Um, you can tell that's also indicated by the green color. So just to compare how the GAT property support um, compares with a newer property, Let's go back up to the top and I'm going to type in a new property, a more new property like the CSS animation timeline property. So I'm going to type in animation timeline. And one thing to note when you are searching for stuff is that there is a lot and there might be things that have the same name that you're looking for. So for example, the first result here, it says animation API, and this is a JavaScript thing. So depending on how you type in your search, you may have to kind of scroll down through the different results. And you can see here, the CSS property that we're looking for animation timeline is third in the list. So just one thing to keep in mind. Another thing you can also do is just make your search a little bit more specific. So instead of typing animation timeline is two words, if we had the hyphen, that means that it's really going to look for just the CSS property of animation timeline. So you can see that compared to the gap property, there is more red for animation timeline, meaning the browser support isn't as much. And you can see in the top right, the global browser support is only at 70% compared to the you know 95% we had for Gap. And you can see that Safari and Firefox do not yet support this. And you can kind of hover over and get some additional information. Um, for example, it says for Firefox, you can enable it by um, changing some of your settings. But overall, um, by default, it's not going to support this yet. So another thing, if you're working with um, newer properties is below the table is this kind of tab section. And this tab that says notes tells you this feature is experimental. Use caution before using in production. So it's just a really quick way that you can do some research and kind of figure out if a CSS property or you know other thing that you're trying to use on your website you know, if it's something that you want to use, or if maybe it might be better to wait a little bit until it has more browser support. All right. So the next resource that I use when I'm building websites is called the accessibility developer guide. So I just type the name accessibility developer guide into the search, and it should be the first result accessibility developer guide.com. So I use this website just to make sure that I'm following the proper accessibility standards in my website. So if there's something that I want to kind of double check and make sure I'm doing it right, I will go back here and read up on the specific feature that I'm thinking about. So they have guides for different areas of accessibility. So if you click on the knowledge link here in the left sidebar, um, they have different areas for um, colors, contrast, semantics, ARIA, keyboard, screen readers, web components. And they also have example code. So if you click on the examples down here, um, I use this as a reference a lot. So for example, sometimes you have elements on your website that you want to visually hide so you can't see them, but you still want those elements to be readable by screen readers. 
So what you can do is under examples, if you click on hiding elements and we want to hide them visually, moving them off screen, you can read about how that works. And, you know, it's really great. They give you some code examples so you can copy this and use it in your own projects. And, you know, they have other really helpful um, examples that you can use as a reference. For example, forms, making your form accessible can be kind of tricky. So if you go to their form page, they give you a general good form example. And I think they also have uh, bad examples. So you can read both of them and, you know, make sure you're doing the right thing here. And what's really cool is for some of their examples, like for this form, they have this example on CodePen. So if you click there, then you can see the actual code that they're doing. And you can use this and use this as a starting point when you're making your own form on your own website, which I find really helpful. So there is a lot of information here, um, but I do recommend checking out this site. And I do plan on making a future video about accessibility basics for people just because you know, I understand that it can be very overwhelming and you may not know how to get started with accessibility. But if you're curious, you know, I think that this website is a really great place to start um, educating and informing yourself about it. Okay, so next up is the resource that might be my most frequently visited resource after MDN. So if you're ever, you know, working with Flexbox or Grid, but you can't remember what that property is that you want to align things a certain way, what I always do when that happens is do a search for CSS tricks and Flexbox. And it should be the first result CSS Flexbox layout guide on CSS tricks. So I love this and you may have heard of this already, but I did want to mention it just because it has been so helpful because they have not only explanations, but they also have these incredibly helpful um, graphics that actually help you visualize what each of the different properties do and how they'll make your Flexbox um, behave. So I would get tripped up a lot with things like um, justify content and not knowing exactly what would happen. And this is just a really great way. So you can see, you know, which one you want to use and then use that value of justify content in your code. And I do think that they have a grid guide as well, just to kind of go along with a Flexbox guide, um, which is also really helpful. So, you know, this is really useful if you're kind of learning Flexbox and Grid for the first time, or even if you've been using it for a while, um, like even myself, sometimes I will still go back to these reference guides just to make sure I'm doing something right and, you know, giving myself a refresher if I need to. So I have seen these guides mentioned a lot, um, but I didn't know if everyone knows about it. So I just wanted to mention them both here. All right, next up. So if you've watched my videos where I'm building a website from scratch, you've probably seen me do a search for fluid typography calculator. And then I'll go to this fluid typography calculator on GitHub pages. So I love this tool so much. Um, basically, it lets you use a clamp function for responsive font sizing so that you don't have to use media queries to change your font size on different devices. And the idea is that with clamp, the font size is going to increase and as your viewport width increases, but then it also adds a minimum and maximum font size so that the text doesn't get too big or too small. So how this works is that um, in the tool, you're going to put in the minimum font size, which is the smallest font size that you want to allow. So you can say something like two rems or 32 pixels. And they have rems here in the example, but you can actually use pixels and it's going to calculate everything and it's going to give you the resulting font size with rems. So you can use whatever unit you want on these. So then you set your max font size. Let's say you can say four rems or 64 pixels. And then you need to put in the viewport minimum and maximum size. So these are the device widths where you want that minimum and maximum font size to hit. So right now we have the minimum viewport size at 320 pixels. So as the viewport width decreases, the font size is going to decrease and it's going to hit the minimum font size of 32 pixels exactly at 320 pixels. So basically at 321 pixels and up the font size is going to be slightly larger than 32 pixels. And then as your viewport width increases, the font size increases too. And then right when you hit the maximum viewport size, which here is 1920 pixels, right when you hit that point, you're going to hit the 64 pixel max font size. So that's how the calculator works. 
And just to give a really quick demonstration, I'm going to copy this code and I'm going to put it into this code pen that I have. So I have a code pen here with an H1 tag and some sort of test text. And then I'm going to paste it into the CSS styles. So now you can see it got bigger. And as I slide the panel over, the viewport width goes down and the text size goes down as well. And then as the viewport width increases, the font size of the H1 tag increases as well. And this is nice because not only do you not need to have media queries in your styles for this, you just need those style rules, but it also makes the font size very fluidly increase and decrease, which is kind of nice. You don't have those jumps that you have when you're using media queries. All right, so next up is the last resource, which again, I think is super helpful and you may not have heard of this one yet. So this one is called Google Web Fonts Helper. And again, I get to it just by typing in the name into the search bar, Google Web Fonts Helper. And it's this first result here at the GWFH dot, you know, this website, but it's called Google Web Fonts Helper. And it looks like this. So what this website does is it lets you host your Google fonts from your own website server, instead of having to use Google CDN to load your fonts. So let me go back a step and let me explain why we need to use this. So I'm here on the actual Google fonts website. And you know, if you want to add a font, usually you'll you know, do a search for the font name. I'll search for Roboto and we have it down here. And then if you want to use Roboto font, you click on this get font button on the top, right? And then you click on the get embed code. And here is some code that they tell you to put in the head of your HTML. So what this is doing is it's loading the font files and the CSS so that your font will load on your website. However, the problem with this is that because we're using the Google APIs.com, and also fonts.gstatic.com to load these resources that basically lets Google see the IP address of every user that goes to your website because they're loading these things from Google's web servers. So this is not very privacy minded and it does not follow the GDPR privacy guidelines for the EU. Also, if Google's font servers go down for whatever reason, even though that's pretty unlikely, I think, um, then that could also mess up the fonts loading on your website. So if you're more privacy minded or you just don't want to depend on Google servers for your fonts, you can host the font files and CSS styles for the font on your own server. So that's where Google Web Fonts Helper comes in. So going back to Google Web Fonts Helper, what you do to use it is type in the name of the font and we'll type in Roboto again, and you select it. And then you can choose the different character sets. The default is Latin and you choose the different styles, meaning the font weights that you want to use. So, you know, you just check whatever boxes you need for your website. And then below that we have the CSS style rules that we're going to copy and paste into, you know, our website project. And then at the bottom is download files. So when you click the download button, it's going to download a zip file of the different font files um, and the font weights that you selected. So here's a zip file and we have our three different font files for the font weights of Roboto that we wanted in the WOF or WOFF um, file format, which is what we need for the web fonts. So this is really helpful. It's really convenient and it's a great tool that is out there that is helping the community. So I like this tool a lot. All right, so these are my favorite resources that I always use when I'm building a website. Let me know down in the comments if you've heard of all of these or if there's any resources that I've missed that you think are just really good. Also, if you want to watch me build a website completely from scratch using a lot of these resources along the way, you might like this video on my second channel, Coder Coder Builds, where I build an educational website with HTML and pure CSS. All right, so thanks for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one.